Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome all of you uh, to the 41st lecture of Archaeological Sciences Center webinar series. Uh, as I mean, I'll, uh, I will uh, recall uh, that we started this webinar uh, series in the year 2020 during COVID, but we were fortunate enough to kind of request many experts working in uh, various fields of archaeology, and uh, we kept the series going on even after uh, the COVID. So that's how we are in the 41st lecture. And today we have uh, with us Dr. Kurush Dalal. And uh, I mean, uh, I know him when I was a student in ASI. I mean, I have met him uh, several times uh, when he was in Deccan College. So I fondly remember him uh, with his very active way of uh, uh, working in archaeology. And uh, uh, I thank Kurush uh, for uh, joining us today to deliver this talk, and it's a, it's going to be a very very interesting talk, uh, uh, probing into the uh, food in ancient uh, time period. So, without wasting much time, I would request uh, Umka to introduce the speaker. Then, uh, Kurush, you can take over. Good afternoon, distinguished guests. I'm um, I'm delighted to welcome our guest for the first like I'm um, I'm delighted to welcome our forty first uh, guest lecturer today. For the talk, Dr. Kurush Dalal. Dr. Kurush Dalal, director of the India Study Center School of Archaeology, Mumbai, is a renowned figure in the field of archaeology with a diverse range of interests spanning memorial stones, numismatics, architecture, defense archaeology, and many more, significantly on uh, culinary archaeology. As co director of the Celset Exploration Project, he has spearheaded extensive urban archaeology initiatives in Mumbai, delving into both medieval and colonial periods. With a decade of uh, teaching experience at the University of Mumbai, he has also contributed significantly as a visiting lecturer and consulting editor, notably exploring the intersection of food and archaeology. His expertise extends to culinary museum consultation and as uh, director of the India Study Center School of, uh, Archaeolo School of Archaeology, he continues to lead innovative research and endeavors in both archaeology and culinary ethnography. Today's talk focuses on the Indian subcontinent's food history, spanning from ancient survival techniques to modern culinary trends vividly depicted through archaeology and culinary ethnography. And uh, as food embodies human stories and deserves a significant place in the study of the human past, let us embark on this exploration of Archibroma, the archaeology of food. So you may begin with the talk now. So thank you so much, Unka, for uh, a very glowing recommendation and uh, Dr. Prabhakar for your very kind words and of course Sharda for uh, getting in touch with me and asking me to do this. It is an absolute singular honor to come on board and do this lecture with IIT. So uh, I am, of course, uh, incredibly uh, thankful. So the title of my talk is Archaeobroma, and I feel that Archaeobroma is one of the specializations in archaeology that we've completely forgotten. We have archaeozoology, and we have paleobotany, uh, and we have paleontology, and so on and so forth. But at no point do archaeologists actually study food. So using the old adage of using Latin, archaeo for the past, broma for food, archaeobroma, the archaeology of food. Now, uh, when I first started uh, uh, this, it was uh, uh, not a very uh, happy journey, I should say. It was a bit of a stressful journey. A close friend of mine, uh, and my wife had both been saying, so my wife first and then a close friend of mine, had both been saying that since I dealt with food on one hand and I dealt with archaeology on the other, I should bring the two together and I felt that I was inadequate. I also felt my wife was biased. Uh, I like to tell all the young men out there to listen to their wives quietly when they tell them things. They're always right, as I've found out now in my old age. Um, well, um, they decided to do a lunch with food from the past. That sounded like more fun. Uh, we thought about a Harappan recipe. We thought about a um, early Iron Age recipe. We thought about a couple of later Iron Age recipes, depending on what we knew from our text, our ingredients, so on and so forth. And we planned a beautiful lunch. And then a week before the lunch, they told me that, uh, by the way, we've announced that you'll be doing a one-hour session on the archaeology of food. And uh, that's when it sank in that I had to get my act together. I thought Google would provide all the answers and I got into a terrible funk because I realized that Google had nothing on the archaeology of food in India. 
absolutely nothing. And I panicked completely. I had a full meltdown. The next morning, I girded my loins, said that I've been doing archaeology for enough years, and that if I couldn't put the archaeology of food together, it wasn't worth talking about. Uh, I did. I still have that PPT. I go back to it every time I'm feeling like I've done a fantastic job with my life. And I look at how terrible that PPT was, but I managed to pull off that day. And thanks to that day, I have been down this rabbit hole of trying to understand food. What I've realized mainly is that as far as food in archaeology is concerned, it's never considered food. We look at it as archaeobotanical remains, paleontological remains. We look at it as archaeozoological remains. We look at it as paleopathologies. We look at it as ceramics, we look at it as archaeological artifacts, archaeological structures, hearth silos, things like that. We never once comprehensively look at it as food. All over the world, people have in the last 30 years started addressing this problem. Uh, in India, uh, it's a little lonely to be the only person championing the cause of the archaeology of food as a holistic approach which brings together archaeology and looks at perhaps one of the most important things that human beings need to do to eat or ingest, to be more technical. There are three things we have to do to live. We have to breathe. It's completely involuntary. We have to sleep. It's also involuntary. And we have to eat, which is completely voluntary. And yet food is something that we seldom talk about. We seldom teach and we take it absolutely for granted and very much so in archaeology as well. The archaeological story of India is a story of roughly 2.6 million years, uh, starting from the very, very early tools that we have now from the Chandigarh region. And uh, it's a little shocking to most of world archaeology because uh, there isn't supposed to be anybody out of Africa that early. But uh, the French are quite convinced that their data is good and their dating is good. So we have some very, very interesting data coming out of the Shivaliks, which tells us that early hominids were in these mountains with their very, very crude chopper chopping tools as early as 2.6 million years ago. The story of food, though, is a story of two parts. The first part starts 2.6 million years ago and ends roughly 11,000 years ago. Almost the entire story of the food that we eat today is a story that starts off at this 11,000 year ago mark and continues all the way till today. So the food preferences and habits of the early first session are not really sadly very, very directly connected to food in India today and to the food that we eat today. And we know terribly little about this. What we do know from the sciences is that traditions and taste profiles are all changed with the exception of sugar and salt. Sugar and salt and the consumption of sugar and salt, these two overwhelming human desires are a direct result of our prehistoric past and they go back way beyond even being human. They go back to being mammalian and perhaps even older than this. Uh, sugar is something that we need. Uh, you could call it brain food if you wanted to. Your myelin sheathing, your firing of your nerves, your entire thinking process is dependent upon sugar. Now, this is not necessarily the white sugar that we eat today, but is a sugar that your body makes out of starches that it consumes. The other thing, which is even more ancient, is salt. Salt is one of the basic building blocks of all life. Uh, salt is needed not just, you know, most people will tell you, oh, yes, yes, uh, to maintain your blood pressure, you need salt. Uh, that's all fine. You don't really need salt just for your blood pressure. You need salt for the integrity of every single cell in your body. You need a perfect saline balance in your cells to ensure that your cells don't either collapse or explode. So you can have implosion or explosion if your salt is not balanced. And don't worry, the body is very good at doing it. Uh, modern human beings need three grams of salt on a daily basis. Uh, Hunter-gatherers got all of this from the wild game that they ate and from the blood of these animals. Farmers, on the other hand, and we are all farmers today, farmers need to add salt to their diets 
And this again is something that is rarely ever spoken about in archaeology, the archaeology of salt. Some of the earliest bones that we have, which may, may talk about food remains uh, from India, are these two teeth from Atirambakka. Uh, this photograph is thanks very much to Dr. Shanti Papu. And there is a small paper on this. If anybody wants uh, a link, I can always provide it later. You can always get in touch with me. Uh, these two teeth, uh, between layers five and six, which are the middle Paleolithic and the late lower Paleolithic layers at Atrambakam, but found not in the context of any stone tools, sadly, are perhaps the earliest evidences we have of any possible food remains. From here, there is a massive, massive leap that we make to Jwalapuram, excavated by Dr. Ravi, uh, by Ravi Purisata, and where we suddenly have, around about 35,000 years ago, a huge quantity of vertebrate animal remains and molluscan shells recovered from excavations at what he calls shelter number nine. And these are very, very interesting. There's gazelle, there's uh, black buck, there's nilgai, there is wild boar, uh, there is four-horned antelope, there is musk deer, and a lot of smaller ungulates that make up the assemblage. Um, it's, of course, very interesting to point towards what the environment was like perhaps then as versus now. But shelter number nine, dated to roughly about 35,000 years ago by the excavators, is perhaps the first place where we begin to look at the kind of hunting that was carried out by ancestors and by the kind of food that they ate. Prior to the excavations at Jwalapuram, it was the upper Paleolithic site of Muchatta Chintamani Gavi in the Kurnul Caves, which was very, very important for us in understanding the kind of food and the kind of diet that early man ate. And it's a very, very fascinating mix of food. There are remains of early horses, rhinoceros, wild boar, large numbers of monkeys, and a lot of animals that are no longer found in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, our ancestors ate a lot of small rodents, bandicoots and things like that, uh, pythons, uh, varanus species, which is your monitor lizard, uh, frogs, and a lot of birds, including in the later levels, uh, gallus gallus or wild chickens. So these are perhaps spanning about the last 20,000 years of occupation at Muchatla Chittamani Gavi, uh, which is an upper site excavated in near the Kurnul Caves or part of the Kurnul Caves in Andhra Pradesh, and uh, gives us a fascinating idea of how opportunistic hunters and opportunistic hunting was responsible for filling our bellies. We don't really know the plant remains that were eaten there, though there is some recent work at the Kurnul Caves, which surprisingly or not surprisingly to archaeologists, gives us the remains of our favorite fruit, uh, Sisyphus mauritiana, or the Indian bear. Uh, plant remains seldom last very long in the Indian record, unless they have been charred, and most of this charring doesn't really happen until we begin to come to the farming period. Um, this is a map, or a graph if you'd like to call it, of sea level change. I regularly have people telling me about how we're all going to die very soon because there's sea level change. And I keep pointing them out to this graph, which tells you that when the last ice sheets started melting 18,000 years ago, the sea level change was 125 meters, not the measly four and five centimeters that people are talking about today, which could very, very easily be just a fluctuation. That does not in any way deny climate change. What I'm trying to say is that we're not going to drown in the next couple of years and that climate change is something that human beings have always risen to the challenge of. And almost every single one of our great evolutionary moments, be it physical or cultural, seem to be linked in one way or the other to climatic shift. To make a very long story short, The first thing that happened was that we had lots and lots of rain 
Lots and lots of open grasslands when the ice sheets ended. Loads of shallow warm seas where there had been only cold coasts. And this resulted in a huge increase in food. But what we didn't realize was that this was a one-time increase. This period which we call the Mesolithic is when we first become sedentary for the first time. We inhabited the forests, we inhabited the coasts, and we kind of didn't inhabit very much the semi-arid and arid zones because we didn't need to. But for the first time in two million years, we no longer needed to be continuously on the move. We didn't need to be continuously nomadic. We could be semi-sedentary or completely sedentary. And with that came a huge rise in populations. Paleodemographics is a bit of a dicey subject even today, but we are looking at a tenfold increase over 2000 years. And then it just didn't stop. It was like a geometric progression. We ran wild. Uh, very, very soon, we were consuming food faster than it could grow. We hadn't realized that the increase in food was a one-time increase and that the increase in population was a continuous increase. Um, stronger groups started pushing weaker groups out from their foraging lands. Weaker groups were forced into semi-arid regions. And we became farmers not because we wanted to, but because we had to. This period of early farming, this period where we conceptualize farming, this period where we choose what to farm, be it animal or plant, is known as the Neolithic or the Neolithic Chalcolithic period. And all our cuisine that we eat today dates back directly to it. We had a choice of growing something that grew once a year and would feed us throughout the year and would provide us with the kind of fuel that our bodies needed. The only thing possible was cereal. So various different cereals from barley and wheat all the way down to millets were cultivated by our ancestors and many, many, many thousands, if not millions of our early ancestors died of malnutrition and starvation whilst they learned how to farm. We did also farm animals, but these were not available in quantities that could be eaten on a daily basis and needed to be kept for special occasions. And we learned how to keep that lactase switch on in our bodies and consume milk way beyond the weaning of human children. Uh, all of those stories are very, very complicated stories, and I'm sure most of you all who've done archaeology have done one of them or the other. Farming was essentially what allowed us to survive, and we ultimately took our animals, which we kept for meat, and skin, then meat, skin, and bone, then meat, skin, bone, and milk, and finally traction. And we learned how to use our animals to bring larger areas of the cultivation. We learned to make neoliths, new stone tools to raise forests, to work wood, to build structures in which we could store our food throughout the year in a safe manner and keep ourselves alive. So wheat, barley, rice and sorghum are the top four contenders for the cereals that we ate. Though in India, it was a lot of the smaller, uh, not even ragi, but uh, kodo millet, barnyard millet, foxtail millet, uh, and little millet that were responsible in Southern India. In Northern India, of course, we had a lot of wheat and barley towards the West and towards the East, interestingly, rice. We domesticated a number of different animals, mainly cattle, the zebu cattle of India, which no longer exist in the wild today. Uh, we've hunted and eaten all the wild uh, variants of our cattle. We also domesticated sheep and goats. We domesticated pigs a little late in the game. And of course, we domesticated the jungle fowl. Uh, biologists are still dis you know, majorly discussing whether the pig and the jungle fowl have really been domesticated or are just variants of wild boars. We brought in an enormous amount of food into our diet, which we eat today, which is completely and totally foreign. And I'm doing this here just to tell you, to wake you up to this fact 
that all of this food that you see over here came to us thanks to the Colombian exchange, which is Christopher Columbus going to America on, well, and finding America instead of finding India and bringing back all of these different things to us. So chikus, guavas, tomatoes, potatoes, chilies, peanuts, and corn all came to us thanks to the Colombian exchange, along with a large number of other things. So you see the famous quintessential Bombay Vada Pao in front of you. And well, there was no Pao in India till the technique of making Pao, which is a Portuguese word for bread, came to us. There were no potatoes. There were no peanuts to make the chutney. There was no peanuts to fry the vadas in. There were no chilies to spice the vadas or to eat alongside. And the vada pao is more of a Portuguese dish than an Indian dish. So blow your friends' brains away the next time. Tell them you're taking them out for something Portuguese and give them a vada pao. A lot of spices are also foreign to us. More about them a little later. And sadly, something that was truly Indian, the banana, has gone via Arabia, via Venice, via Europe, to South America and come back to us. And today it is the Cavendish variety of the uh, well, Central American variant of bananas that we mainly eat in India and we are forgetting most of our own species, uh, our own, sorry, variants. So now to come to the actual archaeology of food. Archaeologists basically use various different tools to recreate the human past. Archaeologists study the human past. Uh, no, we do not dig up dinosaurs. Archaeologists study the human past, comma, in the present, which means everything that we study essentially has to exist today for us to find so that we can understand what has survived from the past and which can help us recreate the past. So it's a jigsaw puzzle with most of the pieces missing most of the time. And the main sub-disciplines used to reconstruct food habits are paleobotany, archaeozoology, paleoanthropology, ceramic studies, ethnography, ethnobotany, and art history. So, paleobotany, and I can't forget Dr. M.D. Kajle, who was my teacher, uh, one of the greatest Indian paleobotanists ever, uh, essentially study ancient plant remains. Uh, they use mainly what we call dry sieving and wet sieving. And wet sieving usually uncovers the maximum botanical data. There are also specialists like uh, palynologists and uh, uh, people like uh, Dr. Sanjay Exembaker, who work with phytoliths and who look at pollen, spores, and phytoliths and help us when nothing else is available. So dry sieving is, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, just passing soil through a sieve. This is usually soil which shows signs of burning, soil which is associated with a hearth or which is with a storage area, because that's the kind of area in which the most food grains and other grains will survive due to charring. Um, wet sieving is a very, very technically complex job. You basically need a very large plastic tub or a part tub, a large piece of wood, water, and soil from the area that you want to see. Yes. Uh, when I was being taught archaeology, you basically threw your soil into this tub, vigorously agitated it with the pole in the water, and we used to jokingly call it making archaeological Manchurian. And then you wait for the sediment to settle down, and all the burnt material automatically rises up because it's lighter than water, and then you pass sieves through it. In these lovely pictures, you have very, very beautiful geological sieves being used. We normally in India use sieves, which our mothers and grandmothers use for rava and maida at home. And we use those sieves and we pull off everything that floats on the top. Then we whack it onto newspapers like you can see on the top right hand side extreme and let it dry. Newspapers are scientifically brilliant because they're terribly bad paper and they soak up all the water and dry up very fast. We then collect everything that's burnt and charred, pack it and send it to the lab where the paleobotanists actually get down to separating plant material from rubbish and then identifying the plant material that they have, which you see on the bottom right hand side. They also look at other things apart from actual visible grain, uh, studying impressions of mud bricks, 
studying impressions in clay, studying impressions in walls. So wherever hay is used uh, to make mud bricks or to plaster walls, this hay is usually the hay from your crops. And a lot of immature plants will end up being thrown into this hay and will survive as impressions. We also have very, very early sickles. So this is the sickle with the bitumen that was used to seal it into a piece of rib or a piece of wood. The wood slash rib is gone. Uh, but we have the bitumen and the stone plates, uh, giving you an idea of what the earliest sickles look like. You also have some very, very early farming communities, uh, proto-neolithic communities in the Vindhyas, Chopani Mando, for example, on the right-hand side, where we are seeing animal domestication and large-scale collection of wild grains. And there's some beautiful wild rice grains whose shape survives in these cattle pens, thanks to uh, cow dung, whose chemical profile uh, allows for preservation. Archaeozoology is probably the biggest contributor to food studies in many, many ways. Archaeozoologists study ancient animal remains. Uh, they look at these to identify the species, of course, to also identify whether they're domesticated or not. And yes, that's a huge thing. Uh, P.P. Joglicker's entire PhD was on this. Uh, we look at butchering signs. We look at domestication signs. We look at paleopathologies. We look at signs of traction, so on and so forth. Uh, an enormous amount of bone debris is collected at uh, Chalcolithic and early historical and sometimes medieval sites. So a lot of statistics is brought into play by archaeozoologists to look at the kind of data that they have. They also study, interestingly, microscopic animals like mites and lice, though these studies are still in their infancy in India. Archaeozoology also includes ethnozoology, looking at what lives in the environment at this time and what is eaten by the people locally, what is hunted, etc. So these slides that you're seeing now are courtesy of Professor B.P. Joglikar. Uh, essentially, archaeozoology is the confluence of anthropology, the study of humans, zoology, the study of animals, and environmental sciences. All of these things come together to make archaeozoology. Archaeozoology looks at various different uh, things found in human habitations, Remains of wild animals, domestic animals, pets, uh, common cells which we eat together, working animals, trade contacts, raw materials, food usage, non-food usage, scavenging, sometimes just oddities which are brought to the site. I ex remember ex excavating at Balathal in Rajasthan and we had one beautiful fragment of an elephant rib. Just one elephant rib fragment from all the other bones of the site. Telling us that somebody picked up an elephant rib bone and brought it back, maybe to use, maybe not to use. And definitely didn't say we were hunting elephants, but that there were elephants in Rajasthan at that time. We then try to understand whether this is food refuse, discarded animals, how these bones were buried, what processes impacted them after burial. Then, of course, how they were excavated. And yes, excavation can shatter bones, sadly, if not done right. And then all of this is looked at by an expert once again in a lab. So simple things that excavators look at is primary butchering areas on the right-hand side versus food refuse on the left-hand side. So if you just find random pieces of bone, it's usually food refuse and bones that have been chucked out. Whereas if you find articulated bones, those are usually end bones that were not taken away from the site and are part of butchering areas. A lot of data about your diet comes from the past, uh, the macroscopic remains, the microscopic remains, uh, the DNA remains, the proteins and amino acids, all of them tell us different things about our food habits. So what happens at an excavation is basically we collect, clean, sort, mend and pack the bones and then transport those bones to the library. In a perfect world, we would have a mini library on site and we would have primary identification going on on site but sadly most excavations in india cannot afford this and the material then goes to a laboratory most universities sadly cannot afford an archaeozoologist so the few archaeozoologists who are practicing get tons and tons of bones from all over india and 
poor people are permanently backlogged and up to their necks in the remains of dead animals. Lots of statistics, as I said, are used. <coughs> Just understanding the density of bones in the various layers tells you about the intensity of animal usage, uh, the kind of comparison of all the bones versus domestic, domestic and wild animals gives you a very good idea about the dependency on hunting as versus domestication at any given site. This is from, uh, I think, G1 side of Ganmer, if I'm not wrong. Uh, one of the most fascinating things that archaeozoology does is it looks at the reduction of a carcass as to how an entire animal carcass is taken and reduced and where the major breaks are made in the bones. And much to our surprise, over the last two and a half thousand to three thousand years, this methodology hasn't changed. All over India, we still break down the carcass in an almost identical manner. And sometimes when people ask me, what is Indian about food? I say, well, this is one of the Indian things about food. We also have some very odd things that turn up in archaeological records. This is from Karanpura in Rajasthan, and there are rhinoceros bones. And enough rhinoceros bones to seemingly point out that there was rhinoceros meat being consumed at the site. Uh, the domestic animals are essentially used for milk, for leather, for bone, for meat, for traction, for wool, and in some cases, goat, even goat hair. Pigs are some of those rare animals which are almost always used only for meat, whereas the others are used often for traction and often for other things. Paleoanthropologists look at human remains. They look at visible signs of trauma, stress, vitamin deficiencies. They look at biomechanics to see how a farming life changes us. And of course, there's genetic studies, which adds to our knowledge, as do various isotope analysis. This is just a simple comparison, rather extreme one, of a modern human skull on the right and Paranthropus robustus on the left about 1.8 million years ago, one of our cousins. Look at the size of his teeth. Look at the size of our teeth. We are basically eating a lot of soft meat, cooked meat more often than not. Poor Paranthropus, Paranthropus robustus is eating a lot of grass and seeds. And then down there, you have the teeth of farmers. Most farmers, if they reached old age, reached incredibly painful old ages with terrible dental cavities. We have huge volumes, more than I think 26 or 27 percent of our farmers had terrible dental cavities and no dentists back in those days. Uh, this is thanks to eating a mono diet of grain along with uh, a lot of grit that comes from our pounding of grain and our turning grain into flour. So there's a lot of stone that gets ground in with it and this abrades the teeth and of course the fact that all grain is ultimately sugar also does its own fair share of damage. This is something that normally doesn't happen in the Indian subcontinent. I don't know of any cases, but in the areas where there were a lot of marshes in the Iron Age and where subsequently these marshes have dried up and are cut for peat, we regularly find human remains, more often than not sacrifices. This is Tolun man, and you can see the rope around his neck. Uh, his clothes have rotted off, but his leather cap and the rope around his neck have still survived. Uh, being buried in a swamp in anaerobic conditions where there is no oxygen and there's an enormous amount of metal in the swampy water, uh, it tans the skin, it turns it into leather and it makes the human body survive much longer than it should. So on the bottom left-hand side, you see the stomach of Tolun Man and inside it was a final meal before he was sacrificed, which is undigested. They recreated the meal. I need to update this. We now know that there's much more than just these things. There are a few other things inside it also. But it was essentially a simple porridge made by boiling a large number of grains, most of which were flax, false flax, barley, and not grass, with, as I said, a few others thrown in. Um, Tolun Man was found in the beginning of television archaeology in Europe. And Sir Mortimer Wheeler was on a show on BBC where they recreated the porridge and they ate it as part of the show. And in his memoirs, he states that it took two large whiskies to keep it down because it was so terrible. So to give you an idea that the food back then was not really as exciting as we'd like to think. There's a lot of evidence of farmers suffering from terrible anemia. 
and iron deficiency, something that women in India suffer from in huge numbers even today. This was mainly due to malaria and living with your own filth around you, not realizing that uh, malaria would cause all kinds of more complicated problems to you. And this is also something that we see along with various different deficiencies of strontium and vitamins and calcium and so on and so forth. We see rickets in children, etc. And all of this is seen in lines on their teeth and on the growth lines of their bones are hampered, so on and so forth. The last physical adaptation of human beings happened thanks to farming. The position of our head on our neck changed. So from hunter-gatherers who were permanently scanning into the distance, we became farmers who were permanently looking down and the attachment of our heads on our vertebrae changed with farming, as did uh, certain things with our feet. So from Inanga, we see uh, about 208 odd burials and we see the impact of being a farmer. Being a farmer means long hours of sitting on your haunches. He might look like his backside is on the ground, but it's not. His backside is in the air. He's resting on his heels. Uh, this is a position which most of us who work in offices and chairs find very, very difficult to do. But it also, when you start doing it from a young age onwards, when you're looking at after your animals, sitting on a high place, looking down at them eat grass or uh, watching your fields, uh, this is something that wears a certain pattern into your tibia, which you can see because of the change work demands on your body. This is one of the most interesting uh, burials that we have from the early Neolithic period. At Mergard, very early Neolithic Mergard, we have a young girl buried with six baby goats. It's a lot of ornaments and all that buried in the crowd position. She's a young lady who's died. And archaeologists believe that this is the nucleus of a small herd of goats that have been sacrificed with her to send with her into the afterlife so that when she arrives there, she will have her own source of wealth and of food. So we surmise that there would be one or two males and the rest would be females and it would be the nucleus of a herd. We can't tell because they're very young animals. Sexual dimorphism is sadly not possible. Ceramists and excavators also provide an enormous amount of additional data in food, which is very, very often seriously overlooked. Silos where food is stored, chulas where food is cooked, hearts of different kinds, tandoors, storage pits, all of that. And of course, various different artifacts telling us how and what they were used for, quirns, mullers, pounders, things like that. Chemists, uh, archaeochemists play a huge role telling us about, you know, ceramists tell us about shapes and things like that. Uh, they tell us about bowls, storage jars, storage vessels, water vessels. Uh, what is the preponderance of, is it flat vessels or bowls, so on and so forth. Uh, chemists help us to understand residues and things like that. And of course, there is plant material in the tempering and sometimes, if you're lucky, animal impressions. So, folk art, icons, figurines, paintings, seals, art objects, coins, footprints, all of this tells us so much about what was being eaten. This is a beautiful pot from Kuldiva, a very, very early uh, Neolithic site in Bihar and uh, cord mark pottery with the impressions of rice. So you have the impressions of rice that have been pressed onto the pot to make a design. And it tells you that between 8,000 and 6,000 BP, or at least 6,000 BC, we had rice cultivation in Bihar. On the left-hand side are two of the earliest known tadurs from the site of Kalibangan. Kalibangan has also given us uh, evidence of chickens. And we could probably surmise that the earliest tandoori chicken happened in northern Rajasthan and not the northwest frontier province. Uh, these, I'm sorry, this is not a color picture, but these are bright red in color. Um, and also give us a very good idea about how flatbreads and things like that were made in the past during the Harappan period. On the right hand side is the famous jumbo copper fish hook from the side of Padri. Uh, it was found in a multi-roomed early Harappan house. Adjacent room had large uh, catfish uh, skulls 
and uh, this these are very interesting. If some of you are interested, you all can look them up. It's called a crucifix catch catfish. The skull looks like Jesus Christ on a cross. I kid you not. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Just do crucifix catfish, and you'll find it. This is my favorite Harappan story of bricks drying outside the town of Harappa, the city of Harappa, and a rabbit coming to eat the the bits and parts of hay and seeds from the brick making process, the dogs at Harappa chasing that rabbit in the hope of a good meal, and an opportunistic leopard passing by saying, yummy, dog, and chasing the dogs. Uh, it's a lovely story, but it didn't happen this way. Uh, these are all from different areas, but it couldn't have happened this way. Uh, they're telling you about different animals leaving behind their marks. And this is also a way of understanding what was available and what was not. Dishes tell us a lot. Uh, dishes tell us about the kind of foods that were eaten, especially flat dishes telling us about the use of flat breads, mainly for food. And the bottom right is my favorite early Harappan bowl. This is the phase one grave bowl in which they're beautiful carp in a marine environment. And you can just imagine filling it with water. And as you drink, uh, ripples will form because of your drinking. And it looks like the fish are swimming in the water, telling you about how observant our ancestors were about their food. Bowls, you can't go wrong with bowls. We have all kinds of bowls. The most interesting are the ones, sorry, on the left-hand side, which are the stud-handled bowls of Gujarat, where eating Gujarati khichdi, the Harappans realized in Gujarat that, you know, eating khichdi was burning their hands, holding their bowls, and they innovatively created a handle for the first time. You wrap your thumb around the handle, and you don't have to burn your hand, and you can eat your khichri. Uh, this is a pre-Harappan innovation, as we've seen at Padri. In the pre-Harappan local culture, we have a stud handle bowl, telling us that by the time the mature Harappans came there, the Gujaratis had already figured this one out. All kinds of residues are found in things. This is on the right-hand side, a beautiful amphorae, a dressel 2-4 amphorae from the Mediterranean. And amphorae will give us all kinds of wine residue remains, fish sauce residue remains, olive oil residue remains, so on and so forth. And archaeopanists, of course, are just raring to go and tell us what all of this is. Rock art also tells us a lot. So this is a herd of Nilgai being hunted by, well, bow and arrow wielding perhaps Mesolithic hunters, perhaps later. Uh, you can see dogs on the top right hand side. You can see a dog. Uh, being used by hunters to herd these animals in one direction. And you can see the hunters in the front uh, waiting to ambush the Nilgai. You can see the Nilgai with arrows stuck in them. And uh, this itself tells you about the kind of food that was eaten by our ancestors too. And this is where we come to some really interesting archaeology. This is the bull powerful against Ethiopia, Ramesses II who died in 1213 BC. And when we unwrapped his mummy, his nostrils were full of peppercorns. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, peppercorns. Oh, the most probable source of these peppercorns, I mean, the only source is India, but the most probable source, of course, is Kerala. The fascinating question that archaeologists need to ask is what was happening in Kerala in the 13th century BC? And interestingly, the earliest, earliest dates after calibration of the megalithic cultures from Kerala are around the 13th century BC. So perhaps trade with the Red Sea was taking place way, way earlier than we have imagined. Similar was the trade in Malabathrum and Cinnamon. So two kinds of cinnamon, the one on the left, Zelanika from Sri Lanka, the one on the right, Cassia bark from India, both, of course, cinnamons. We get them in the wrapping of mummies. We see the Phoenicians extending their trade through the Sinai and into the Red Sea. And we see them bringing these goods. And Malabathrum is something that is always, as in this is uh, your Tej uh, Patta or Tamal Patta, Malabathrum is a huge player all the way into the Indo-Roman period and even after that, 
And this is a typical Phoenician trading route over here and a typical Phoenician trading ship. Uh, probably some of the earliest evidences we have for trading with India. And uh, most of us, sadly, in archaeology only know about Indo-Roman trade. We rarely ever talk about Greco-Egyptian trade. So Indo-Roman trade actually happened only in the footsteps of Greco-Egyptian trade. Indo-Roman trade is between the 1st and 2nd centuries AD and all the way up to the 5th century AD. But it's in the 2nd century AD that Eudoxus of Sisychus, a Greek navigator, explored the Arabian Sea for Ptolemy the 8th. Sadly, Ptolemy cheated him. At the end of his first journey, he almost didn't make a second one. But he made a second one and a third one. And uh, his journey started in 118 BC. We have beautiful records for this. And uh, we know that he came back with a whole load of spices. So Eudoxus navigating the various voyages and sailing without a guide the second time. The first time, interestingly, Eudoxus learns about India and spices from a shipwrecked Indian sailor. And very neatly pens it all down for us. From at least the 3rd century BC, if not earlier, way before Eudoxus, Hippocrates, Epicurus, and Theophrastus all talk about uh, long pepper, round pepper, and pepper root, which are coming from India to Greece, and how they are so important for both medicine and for food. We know these exchanges were taking place. Uh, we have a beautiful Buddha image now from Berenike. And when Sidebotham started excavating Berenike, everybody laughed at him. But on the right-hand side, you can see this huge dolium with seven and a half kilograms of black pepper still in it. Still inside it, 1800 years later. So uh, surprisingly, we found rice also at Berenike, telling us that there was definitely, and this Buddha image now with an inscription by an Indian captain, telling us that there were Indian sailors sailing up the Red Sea and bringing various different goods. We have the Periplus Merarithium telling us about the various different coasts and the various different ships and the various different goods. This is, of course, the site of Patanam. On the top, the excavations under Cherian. On the left-hand side, the very, very famous Muziris document, which tells us about the bringing of black pepper corns from Muziris uh, to Aden. So, in the Roman era, a large number of very, very interesting materials have been found to have been taken away by, sorry, by our friends, uh, the Romans. Uh, Beetle nut, Turmeric, uh, Kala Elaichi, Green Elaichi, Ginger, and Black Pepper have all been found at Kisar and at Berenike by the archaeologists working there. Now, we have Black Pepper corn remains from Hadrian's Wall, telling us that common legionaries could also afford a little bit of pepper all the way up at Hadrian's Wall on the northernmost frontier of the Roman Empire in Britain. So Malabathrum, long pepper, round pepper, sesame, moong dal, coconuts, elaichi, elcha, uh, peacocks, monkeys, coiks, trifoil, and even things like myrobalum, our good friend, the aula, of course dried, were all exported by us from India. And thanks to the records of the Romans, and thanks to the finds in Roman ports, we know that they were definitely eaten in India. Of course, once in a while, you get incredibly lucky in archaeology. This is uh, a beautiful mural from the wall of the tomb of the overseer of the kitchens of the men who built the pyramids. And the entire process of making bread from the silos on the top left to the pounding of the flour on the top right, to the kneading of the flour in the center, to the fitting it into molds and then baking it and then emptying the molds right on the extreme right hand side, bottom of the bread loaves. We have the entire process of the making of bread 
while the pyramids were being built in the third dynasty as early as four and a half thousand years ago. This, by the way, is the oldest surviving loaf of bread from Egypt that I know of, which is not burnt, but which is actually an intact loaf of bread. This is from the ninth dynasty of the reign of Men Mentuhotep, uh, putting it around somewhere around 2000 BC. Uh, approximately a 4,000 year old loaf of bread still intact to this very day. In recent years, there's been a huge number of studies looking at microscopic microbotany, microzoology, microchemistry, biochemistry, botanical chemistry, etc. And it has been changing the way we look at food. This is only for representative purposes, but the excavations at Farmana in a burial yielded a pot where Arunima Kashyap and Steve Weber carefully extracted lipids from the body of the pot and allowed us to reconstruct what we half jokingly call the world's oldest curry, which, by the way, is brinjols, mangoes, uh, some ginger or turmeric or both, uh, and uh, salt, of course, and uh, mustard oil. So I remember making this for the Museum of Food and Drink in New York. Uh, we made it, of course, in India. And we then ate it, and it tasted quite peculiar, to say the least. Uh, the Harappans would have had slightly different tasting food from what we enjoy today. Uh, starch residue analysis. This is from Cook Swamp in New Guinea, where they almost, where they had a brief Neolithic and almost had civilization, but they couldn't make it just with yams and without any cereals. So that's a typical axe on the top left-hand side. And on the right is the purple yam, Diascoria alata, whose starch cells we find embedded in these axes, which were used to prepare it. Protein residue analysis, which used to be $1,000 per sample, which I hear has come down considerably to about $200, $200. I hope IIT Gandhinagar is doing something in this direction. Uh, protein residue analysis tells us the last protein that was sliced, cut, penetrated, poked by stone tools. So they did a lot of this in America with Paleo-Indian arrowheads. And subsequently, they've been doing it with stone tools all over. This is why we've stopped washing stone tools and pottery these days. This is from Azraq in Jordan. It's a 125,000-year-old site, most probably uh, Neolithic, perhaps very, very early ancient modern human. We have rhinoceros slaughter from this tool, uh, which is completely mind-blowing to think that you know, over one and a quarter lakh yeah. years ago, our ancestors were hunting and slaughtering rhinoceros. We also know that they were eating beef, duck, horse, and camel at the same time from other stone tools. This is Professor Lee Liu of Stanford, the godmother of alcohol studies. And Rakafet Cave in Israel tells us that before we started turning grain into bread, we were turning it into beer. Uh, this is not the kind of beer that we drink today. This would have been a murky, sour liquid, about 4 to 5 percent alcohol at the very most. And would have been more like an umbil that is eaten in Maharashtra for breakfast, and which is also eaten in Nigeria, made out of sorghum. But that the earliest use of grain was beer making. So every bread basically is a bunch of grains that missed out on its destiny to be beer. Oh, fabulous work done by Prabhu Chirwalkar's excavations and KK Chakrabarti's studies uh, from the side of Potada Bhadli. Again, Prabhu spent four years waiting to wash his pottery because analysis was going on. And we now know that there was enormous milk processing in the Kutch. And this milk was mainly buffalo milk in the run of Kutch. And then the Harappans were processing milk into curd and most probably paneer and other things like that. Uh, Patrick McGowan has managed to actually take out the yeast and reactivate it from Etruscan wine jars and make beer out of it. Uh, ethnobotany looks at various millets and pseudo millets, how they're cultivated to try and understand how they were cultivated in the past. There's an enormous amount of foraging that we overlook today in our cities. 
And if we talk to our cousins in the villages, even today, there is a lot of foraging that is done, especially in the months of May and June when no vegetables are available. This is Amorphophallus commutatus or dragon stalk yam, which is a huge delicacy in Western Maharashtra. And of course, one of the great superfoods of all time, Sisyphus mauritiana. That image on the top left-hand side, ladies and gentlemen, is from Africa, not from India. The bottom right-hand side image is from India of dried Sisyphus mauritiana. We used to call them Sisyphus jujuba. This is the bear. Uh, more vitamin C, more iron than anything else. Uh, more nutrition than any other fruit that you can have. And still very, very recently mixed with uh, flour by the Adivasis of Western India to make rotis during the monsoons when there would be nothing else for them to eat and this would nourish them through bad times. We find the burnt pits of Sisyphus Mauritiana in all our archaeological sites in the Deccan and in Central India and other places uh, telling us about how important this was as food. So to bring a long story short, Archaeologists use a very multi-pronged approach to reconstruct the past. Food habits helps us understand what we ate, helps us understand our lifestyles, helps us understand our evolution, our adaptation. It helps us to understand where our food came from, what journeys it has taken. And it plays a very, very vital role in our understanding of what we call the man-land relationship and in helping us to understand why we eat what we eat. Uh, thank you very much to IIT Gandhinagar, Professor Prabhakar and all his colleagues and to all of you all who are listening to me uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kuni, for this wonderful talk. Uh, it was uh, really a pleasant uh, lecture, I would say, hearing to you. The way you explain, uh, it's very simple and uh, it reminds me many, many uh, things from the past also. So thank you so much. And uh, I would request Sharda to take over and moderate the Q&A session. We have a few questions already. Uh, Dr. Kurush, you can also look into the Q&A box while Sharda will read out. You can also, sure, have, sure. You can also have a look into them. So Dr. Richa Kapoor says, did people have food allergies in ancient times? Were the environmental factors a role behind that and how? That's so uh, that's a very good question. A uh, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to answer. Um, I'm sure that they had allergies back then also. But I doubt that there was an environmental role at that time. It was more about new foods and just genetic issues of uh, the lack of adaptability. I'd also like to point out here that uh, if you had a food allergy in the past, and uh, if it was a serious food allergy, you would not live long enough to pass those genes on. It would kill you. There was uh, no EpiPen waiting to be jabbed into your chest to bring you back if you went into anaphylactic shock. Um, are there any archaeological evidences besides the one about Ramesses and Roman accounts that point out a possible culinary interaction between ancient Egypt and India? Yes, yes, lots of it. So we have a whole list of spices that was taxed at Alexandria. The reason why spices are called spices is that they were a species. They were on a special list of taxation. And that is why that is where the word spices comes from. So that itself is a very, very important uh, uh, thing. Uh, there are so many of these things that we can add. So many dishes that we hear of from the Roman world. If you read uh, Dera Cucinaria, uh, one of the oldest uh, surviving uh, European uh, cookbooks. Uh, it has some very, very interesting uh, dishes using pepper, ginger, so on and so forth. And we know that all of this went from India. In fact, ginger was something we exported from Kerala till as recently as the 19th century. The late 19th, early 20th century, dried ginger was a very, very big export. Um, we exported onions. So, you know, I didn't even get a chance to get into the medieval period, really. Mm -hmm. But almost all the onions in the UAE came from India. And they came on dhows from Gujarat. So the Dungli of Gujarat was the number one allium that was sold in the entire Persian Gulf. So Iran and the UAE and Kuwait 
and Oman got all the onions from India. So all those dishes that have onions are Indian dishes. Similarly, saffron from uh, Persia came down to uh, Peninsula India via the same route. The porota of the south came via the same route. So there exchanges this way and that way. Had it not been for the Mughals, the Jains of India would have not had uh, asafoetida to flavor their food. So hing came. Hing is, by the way, something that is only wild. To this day, there is no domestic hing. It is all collected in the wild. <coughs> the Indian government's actually trying to plant hing plants in Himachal Pradesh to see if we can grow them. Uh, because they're very worried about the source of hing. So hing basically comes from Afghanistan and uh, eastern uh, Iran. And uh, asafoetida basically was something that the Persians were using for the longest time. And then when Humayun ran away and came back, his cooks brought it back with him. So there's all kinds of fascinating movements of food that take place this way and that way. The fact that, uh, you know, uh, all the way till where the Romans went was essentially your uh, the lower part of Thailand. And the fact that fish sauce, garum, which the Romans love so much, um, is something that suddenly appears in Southeast Asia and then extends all the way to Korea thanks to the Southeast Asian contact. So there is movement this way and there is movement that way. Uh, we believe that turmeric was something that moved very early along with ginger when the Austronesians were moving towards Austronesia perhaps as early as uh, 30 or 40,000 years ago. Um... How useful Adivasi knowledge traditions are for reconstructing prehistoric foodways and culinary systems. Very important. Because most Adivasi <coughs> knowledge traditions uh, use a lot of local products, which we've stopped using. And this allows us to uh, understand the use of various different products that we very often don't even know about. So yes, that helps. Also cooking methods. So sometimes there are fascinating cooking methods and how food is put together. Uh, the most common, and I'm sorry to use this example, uh, the famous ant chutney of Bastar. The fact that it gives them a lot of vitamin C and it replaces salt, which is very difficult to find in their diets. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I realized when I realized that salt had, it, had to be added to all farmers' diets was that there were obviously salt trails from the west coast of India going into the hinterland. So how do you find evidence of that? The evidence is there at Inamgao. At Inamgao, uh, I was told by Professor Thomas that there are the bones of uh, marine fish. There are vertebrae from marine fish. And uh, it made sense to me that the marine fish vertebrae in small numbers would have basically been the dried fish that uh, was being traded. And who would be doing this dried fish trading without salt? You can't do this without salt, right? So it would be the salt makers who were trading salt and by the way, also bringing some delicacies like dried fish. We know that salt was bright price in the Himalayas because it was so scarce. So there are some fascinating things like this and uh, you know they give us a whole different view on things. Uh, Jai Sharma says, are we able to exactly recreate recipes from long ago? A um, mm, little bit here, a little bit there. Using uh, lipid profiles and things like that, we can tell you all the ingredients. But we can't necessarily tell you the quantities. A lot of it is also common sense. I mean, if you're making a dish with ginger and uh, bengan, there won't be equal parts ginger and bengan. Ginger would be an aromatic. So automatically you would reduce the quantity of that. So, uh, a lot of it is common sense. The earliest cookbooks in the world are the Yale tablets, 1700 BC from Mesopotamia. Uh, all recipes are written just as a list of ingredients. They don't tell you how to process it. They don't tell you how much to put. It's taken for granted that if you cook, you know how much of what to put into it. Uh, some of the earliest uh, uh, Bengali recipe books are similar. It, it looks like prose. There are three lines and the recipe is over. And the recipe is an incredibly complicated recipe. So uh, 
all kinds of different things were eaten, are eaten, and continue to be eaten. So for the longest time, we thought that the only, uh, uh, what do we call it? The only orchid that we eat is uh, our vanilla. And then much to the surprise of people working with food, we found out that in Sikkim, there are a number of different kinds of orchids which are eaten. Um, they're incredibly bitter and very difficult to eat. And they're usually eaten once or twice a year for medicinal purposes. But that they are consumed. So, you know, it changes our entire worldview of looking at things. Uh, the fact that tea existed in Assam and people in Assam knew about it and the British didn't have to steal it from the Chinese. And, uh, you know, Darjeeling tea almost got called Saranpur because the first tea that was brought to India was destined to go to Saranpur in UP. And it was in closed glass containers to keep it from dehydrating. And when it landed in Calcutta, the, the idiot at the botanical gardens opened it and watered all of it. So everything died in its terrariums. So they had to steal tea a second time. And this time they sent it up to Darjeeling. So yeah, there's the, the story of food and food archaeology is a very, 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 very interesting story. Uh, thank there you. There are some more questions. Uh, uh, Sri Lakshmi. There's one by Sri Lakshmi. Yeah. Were there any food taboos, omens followed by people in early history period in South? I wouldn't know. Because if there's a food taboo, there'd be no uh, remnants of it. So we can't really tell unless we specifically find some written material or something like that, we can't tell. Uh, anything that we find in the archaeological record is what is consumed. So that what is not consumed will not be there in the archaeological record. I don't know any way, maybe Sharda or Unka or Prabhakar sir can answer this, but I can't see any way of this being possible. Uh, Vivek Garg says, according to you, how many centuries behind we can establish trade relations with India and Africa? That depends on which part of Africa you're talking about, Vivek. Are you talking about the Horn of Africa? Then I would say 1300 BC. Because those peppercorns are going. And if those peppercorns are going, they're definitely going via the Horn of Africa, via Ethiopia, via the Sudan. We have some very early Sudanese ports. We have some very, very early ports that come up uh, on the coast, right in the third and fourth dynasties, we have ports being built by the pharaohs on the Red Sea coast. We know definitely that with the Hyksos migrations uh, by the 11th, 12th century AD, uh, BC, we have the Phoenicians in the Red Sea. So uh, there are a lot of players and we still haven't even understood what's happening on the Arab side of things. It's only now that Saudi Arabia is opening up its archaeology to the world. And the kind of data that is coming out of there is crazy. The kind of trade routes across Saudi Arabia from the Hadramut across all the way to uh, uh, the Mediterranean, fascinating. So uh, definitely Africa we were in touch with. We know the work of Felix Chami and others tells us that uh, Indo-Roman trade was definitely impacting in some way or the other the famous uh, Kenyan sites but in very small uh, volumes. We don't know what it was they were getting from the Africans. We have uh, Indian ceramics sometimes, we have some Indo-Pacific glass beads and things like that. But then Indo-Pacific glass beads are seen in Vietnam in the 5th century BC. And that's way before any uh, Romans had a twinkle in their mother's eye to come to India. The fact that our recent excavations on the west coast of India have given us a, 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 I mean, I'm kind of jumping the gun on this, but we have an excavation on the west coast of India where we have a port site from the 3rd century BC. And we aren't supposed to have port sites then, are we? But we did. The uh, Egyptians and the uh, Romans and the Greeks did not come to an India by saying, Chalo, let's go eastwards and see kya milta hai. It wasn't like that. There was trade already going on and this trade intensified. So the so-called Indo-Roman trade is an intensification of trade. Greco-Egyptian trade was on and perhaps Egyptian trade was on even before. So Malti says, given the movements of ingredients over such distances, is it possible to designate any cuisine or food as authentic? The short answer, no. There is no such thing as authentic. Food changes with every generation, 
food changes with every 50 to 100 kilometers, if not less. There is nothing authentic about food. Just because your grandmother made it doesn't make it authentic. Uh, just think of all the aloo parathas of India and the lagnacha batatachi bhaji of the Maharashtrians and uh, the potatoes in the mutton gravies of uh, Lucknow. No potatoes. No widespread use of potatoes. I mean, the earliest potatoes come in about 400 years ago, but potatoes really become popular in the last 200 years when the British want them grown to feed their armies. So uh, there is there is no really such thing as authentic. Uh, if you want to understand pre-Columbian food in India, then studying Brahmin uh, funerary food is very interesting, especially in southern India. When you study the uh, Shrad food of the Ayers and the Ayangars, it is devoid of any of the ingredients that came later with the Colombian exchange. So that's original ingredients, not necessarily methodologies. Uh, though some of them may be quite old. Uh, it would be much of a surprise to people that South India did not domesticate cereal first. It domesticated dal first. The earliest known domesticate from South India is actually uh, horse crack. And then a lot of the smaller millets. Rice came to southern India less than two and a half thousand years ago. So uh, the original idli was 100% urad dal. And we know this because we have enough records of this. And that the idli was adulterated with rice. Basically to make it cheaper. So you start with a little rice, then a little more rice, and a little more rice, and then it's 50-50, and then it's one quarter urad dal, and it's one fifth urad dal. So many people don't put any urad dal at all. And no urad dal was heard in the making of modern idlis. So, you know, uh, replacements happen. I still remember Deccan College, and we realized that there was a 300-year gap between the earliest uh, epigraphical record of sambar and chutney. So they were eating the idlis with chutney and with no sambar for 300 years. I remember Dr. Rajguru being shocked absolutely shocked. And I remember poor Mrs. Araule was doing the research and reporting on it, being mortified when Rajguru was like, oh my God, they had no idli sambar for 300 years. And uh, yeah, happier days. I miss Dr. Rajguru. Do we have the remains of ancient aquaculture in India? Yes, we do. They're called fish traps. We find the remnants all over the coast. That's an entire lecture by itself. Ayan, or get in touch with me and we'll talk about it someday directly. But fish traps going back probably from the Mesolithic to the modern period are seen all over the coast of India. Our values change. Our requirements change. We should eat and let eat. Uh, we realized that there was not enough space to grow animals for meat. We, our populations were increasing and we needed more and more land to bring under cultivation for grain. So we switched to a renewable source of animal produce, which was basically milk, and turned milk into ghee, butter, curd, etc. And please understand that uh, you need animal produce. You can't get your B vitamins out of vegetables. You can't get your vitamin D out of vegetables. On a 100% vegan diet, you would have to eat 5 kilos of button mushrooms every day. Every day, 5 kilos to get your vitamin D requirement. You can get that in one glass of whole cream milk. And most Indian women and a lot of Indian men are vitamin D deficient. Uh, 30 grams of fish is all you need every day to give you all the vitamin D and calcium that you need. So sometimes, uh, how to get in touch with me? At the rate Kurush Dalal on Instagram. K-U-R-U-S-H-D-A-L-A-L -L on Instagram. Quite a few revelations, I think. We're all going to go back and think what we have been eating. And um, As they say, no, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. Is that how the saying goes? Yeah. Very much. But I honestly believe that we should learn to eat and let eat. We've got to stop persecuting people on the basis of what they eat or seeing them as different because they eat different things from us. Uh, and this is a discrimination that's very common. And it's not even necessarily veg, non-veg, or beef, non-beef, or things like that. I know so many people who can't stand the akuni that's eaten in uh, the Northeast. 
just because you can't stand it that's your problem not ours you know the the shidol match of silet which is a beautifully fermented fish preparation uh, most uh, non siletis can't handle it okay tough limburger cheese gorgonzola a good gorgonzola thing of joy most people can't handle it fair enough <laughs> eat and let eat to each their own <clears throat> because it's such a matter of taste right i mean it's just completely and it can change so much within a single life life lifespan or yeah, yeah. individuals the lifetime yeah so that's the whole anthropology of food when we look at neophilia and neophobia and the human need to try new things in all walks of life and in food and the bulk of humans are neophilic where they want to try new things and a small quantity are neophobic where they are like dal chawal and aloo sabji every day is good so and i have, i have a question so you showed a lot of um, artifacts like ceramics right or tools or whatever so these were probably belonging to just one individual or one family or one household and say i out of uh, this lipid residue analysis or the associated bones or uh, botanical remains from the same context i'm able to give a, a kind of a construct that this this culture was consuming this or uh, was aware of this ingredient or this type of food <clears throat> but are we uh, isn't it a stretch of imagination by generalizing things maybe we, maybe that that lipid yes, is no. only talking about that particular household or... no no yes said no i'll tell i'll give you an example <clears throat> ingredient can be processed differently and you can see it archaeologically uh when you go to karnataka there is a very clear divide today karnataka between north karnataka and south karnataka the main food grain is ragi mm -hmm. eleusin korakana okay uh both sides more jolada in the north less jolada in the south but jowar that is but that's main food grain is ragi when you go to the uh burials of the iron age and you go to the cyst burials in the dolmenoid cysts and you look at the ceramics in the dolmenoid cysts the dolmenoid cysts of northern karnataka that's uh, about 1000 bc onwards okay uh, all have flat platters and the dolmenoid cysts of southern karnataka same fabric same ceramic black and red ware have bowls and the reason is that north karnataka influenced by maharashtra and north of maharashtra eats flat breads bhakri mm -hmm. south karnataka eats ragi butte which is the porridge that's turned into balls <laughs> and placed in a bowl and you put your saru on top of it and you eat from a bowl so, so the vessel forms the yes, vessel forms can separate this. vessel forms can separate the food morphologies wow this is very interesting yeah <clears throat> so you've yeah. got to be careful when you jump to conclusions, and you've got to amass enough data. Enough data, yeah. Uh, I have still have problems about what is happening in Kerala in one two one three BC. If Ramesses' nostrils are packed with peppercorns, who the hell is it that is dealing with these guys coming from Africa? And they can't be coming from Af uh, you know Africa and plucking peppercorns by themselves. Somebody is amassing peppercorns and selling them to these guys. and then it gets very interesting the earliest iron age dates from kerala or the earliest occupational dates from kerala which are you know uh, from the iron age from the megalithic period are 1300 bc so they seem to be uh, uh, i mean it is it's very very tempting to make the 1 plus 1 equal to 5 this thing that yeah these guys are making their way across from tamil nadu because we are seeing the early iron age in tamil nadu and in some of the earliest uh, uh, burials in uh, kerala we are still seeing neolithic stone cells so the iron age is coming across and they are trading with people on this coast and they are trading pepper and they are probably trading pepper back with the people in tamil nadu also so the pepper trade might be one of the oldest trade routes in india especially peninsula india that De definitely not going overland from afghanistan you know from pakistan afghanistan iran iraq Very and down to yeah. egypt They're definitely not no peppercorns are traveling that that is ridiculous at least uh, 
at least maritime trade is uh, much much older and i think some sort of connections we are at to kind of find otherwise maritime uh, trade we have fairly uh, i mean very good evidence at least third millennium bc and uh, i think we can take it even further to 7th 8th millennium uh, because of the connections between mehergarh and the oman peninsula yes there's a very long history and maybe we are missing or uh, yet to find some more sites so interestingly uh, recently we have found lot of shell midden sites near dolavira there you go sir so there you is, go that is again uh, 7th millennium right so it's really one part of human culinary history that are totally dependent upon uh, a very different kind of diet and ultimately they were they could be the seafarers and uh, connections which they have made absolutely so no, i think we aren't looking for it once we start looking for it i mean this is this is something i learned in archaeology you know once you find something and you identify it then everybody finds it yeah yeah uh, i remember in 80 uh, in 90 uh, 1992 93 Uh, I went to Bareilly for a conference, and uh, uh, there was a beautiful paper on fish otoliths. I didn't even know what an otolith was. Fish ear bones, wow, from Gujarat, and I was like, "Wow, oh, this is a very interesting thing." Didn't even know you could identify fish on the basis of the ear bones because you can't identify species on the basis of their vertebral discs, which is what we normally get. And we came back, and we were excavating at Padri. This must be season three at Padri. Or four, and one of the girls was arguing with another one of the girls about what was coming out of sorting. Major argument. I still remember her name because this her name was Kali, and she came to me and said, "Sir, you told me that if I find something, we should bring it to you." And they are all saying it's a stone, but I know it's not a stone. And there was a beautiful charred triangular otolith. Now she picked it because it was charred. So I made a big U and cry and said, "Say she is right, and you are all wrong." And pass this on to everybody. We came back with a bag of otoliths. So the previous three seasons we hadn't found a single otolith, which means that they were there. We missed them, you know, just because we didn't know what they were. And these are the stories in archaeology that we don't tell our students for reasons that I don't know. I find difficult sometimes, but well, whatever. And uh, there's so much material, so much data that. Uh, once we start looking for it we'll find it absolutely yeah i think we don't have any more questions so thank you once again dr purush for this wonderful talk and uh, kind of uh, opening up a kind of lot of uh, interesting debates and maybe we'll we'll be looking into more answers in the future right 